Welcome to episode 359 of the Reformed Brotherhood. I'm Jesse. And I'm Tony, and we are proud members of the Society of Reformed Podcasters. Oh, the sky comes falling down for you, there's nothing in this world I wouldn't do. Hey, brother. Hey, brother. Do you ever get that feeling sometimes at the end of a season that you just don't want it to end? Yeah, like like the end of summer or like the season, like the baseball season. Yeah, season has multiple uses. Season. Yeah, any season, any period of life, any discrete interval. And for some of us in the Northern Hemisphere, it is the end of the summer season, at least on the calendar. And we've been spending all this time this summer in the disciples' prayer. And uh, last week, we looked at some other prayers in the Bible and how we see so much that's reflected in those prayers also in the disciples' prayer. And we're doing that again. So we're kind of hanging on to this season. And I am maybe like you have really just been enjoying it and seeing prayer modeled, yeah. spending some time speaking about the theology of prayer, or even maybe to say it with more finer points, the theology that's embedded in prayer that we find in the Bible, how it restores us, how it's what a great activity that God gives us to do with him, and then to have these models put forward. So on this episode, we're going to talk about what's often called like the high priestly prayer from yeah. John 17. And we've sometimes made sometimes made that nuanced distinction, which I think is more than just nuance. It's helpful that what we've been talking about that we often call the Lord's prayer is the prayer that our Lord gave to his disciples to pray. And so it's their prayer. It's our prayer. This one is a little bit different. And so I think we're going to have a lot of fun wading into this. I think we have it slated for just one episode, which seems <laughs> unachievable, but Let's just see how it goes. Everybody come along with us on this journey. So we're going to be in John 17 today. But before we take a road trip from the disciples' prayer into our Lord's prayer that he himself prays for us, let's spend a little bit of time. Let's exit the highway of prayer just for a second to take a pit stop in the land of affirmations and denials. What are you affirming with on this episode? So I'm affirming my wife. And there's a very particular, a very particular reason. So my wife is uh, affirmation worthy uh, for a number of reasons, but she, uh, she has taken it upon herself very recently to uh, join the friends of the library uh, board for our town. And my wife is an avid reader. Um, she, uh, it, it's even, even with a toddler that she's chasing around, it's not uncommon for her to finish um, you know, two or three books, uh, like a week. Um, I think her record was she read a hundred books in a year at one point. So lots of books and not just like super easy, like young adult fiction, like she's reading big, long novels. So she joined the friends of the library, uh, board and she took it upon herself to propose plan. And this morning execute a children's concert with an artist named Mr. Aaron. And so she she did all the planning. She recruited this guy. She coordinated um, the location. And, you know, we live in a relatively small town. There was about 60 people there. Wow. Which, which Fantastic. Some people are probably like, that's not a lot. But for our town, for there to be 60, about 30 kids and their parents, that's huge. It was a very, very successful event. And the, the main thing I want to commend her for is she's doing this out of her commitment to Jesus Christ, not not uh, in some sort of like uh, like Trojan horse gospel kind of a thing, but purely out of the idea and purely out of a commitment that God loves our neighbors and he calls us to love our neighbors. And although the, the first and foremost act of love that we show for our neighbors is to pray for them and to share the gospel with them, we also love our neighbors by doing civic good, right? By just doing good things. And this was an opportunity for parents to get out with their kids, to enjoy some good wholesome music, spend some time outside to meet other parents and to see other parents. Um, and it just sets up my wife as somebody in the community that people can can respect, who they can appreciate. And so if and when God opens a door for an explicit gospel presentation of some sort, or a call to repentance of some sort, um, it has opened the door in a way where she is now adorned uh, herself or has been adorned by the Holy Spirit through her work with a reputation of trustworthiness and of being someone who cares for the community. So I'm not a, I'm not a, uh, like a, um, 
like a transformationalist, right? I'm not like a do this for the welfare of the city kind of person. Like I don't, it's not, this is not the gospel, right? My wife was not engaged in evangelism today, but she was engaged in serving the community and doing something that's just genuinely good. So um, absolutely, like I said, there's many things that she's worth affirming. Uh, she has and is that is worth affirming, but specifically today, the way that she just served her community. It was just really, really great to see. Yeah, good on her. I love that because I think sometimes we, maybe in the reform community in particular, we have this sense where, well, we're not just going to do good things if there's like no gospel. Right. Like you said, if there's no like Trojan horse in that, like, why am I doing it? But this idea that's that really what God calls us to do is these acts of love. And these small acts of love come behind them or embedded in them, this presentation of gospel living. Yeah. So it's not that you would expect like, well, because Ashley's done this, like somebody's going to come up to her and be like, you're so different. Would it tell me what is the difference? And you're like, maybe that'll happen. Sometimes it does. Yeah. But the the great value here is that she comes where the the intent behind all the content that she's just put forward is influenced by Jesus. Right. And so like, it's okay to do good and kind things. In fact, we ought to do them. Even if we feel like we're, there's no gospel credit here. There's always gospel credit because we're being obedient to Jesus who says, reach out and love, find opportunity, make opportunity, be volitional to go out into your communities. And I think sometimes Christians are underrepresented in those types of roles. Yeah, Serve on a board, go be a part of your notary, like do all these things because in so doing them, you are representing and caring for this beautiful fragrance of God because imbued in everything you're doing is instead this gospel love. There it is behind it is Jesus sacrificing himself for you so that we might go out and live in love in a different way. Even if your neighbors are doing the same thing, right? You are doing it differently. Yeah. And that's all that matters. Yeah. But it is like an act of pure love as opposed to like, I'm sure there'd be plenty of people that would say, like, well, listen, we do this because we want the children to be better connected. We want the time. All those things are true. But I know Ashley goes out and does those with the love of Christ. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. So I don't know that there's much more that I can add about it. Uh, on a, a very small side note, I did listen to uh, Pancake Robot last week, and how dare you? Because now that's stuck in my head permanently. Uh, and I used ChatGPT to summarize the narrative, which was, oh, was so a, an amazing exercise. Uh, but also this this children's singer, his name is Mr. Aaron, and he does just fun, wholesome music. So if you've got kids... Um, he's a he's a relatively local artist to New Hampshire. He, he's from Concord, which is maybe about an hour, hour and a half south of where I live. Um, check him out. He's on you know YouTube, Apple Music, all that stuff. But just good, fun, kind of silly, wholesome, like Raffi style music without some of the like spiritualizing that Raffi did did in some of his later years, um, his later albums. But yeah, he's he's just fun, just fun, good, wholesome music. I love that. And again, we've talked about this before, but. If you want to listen to Banana Phone, which is an amazing song, or Pancake Robot, or in our group chat, which anybody who's listening can join, if you want to join that group chat, you just go to t.me backslash Reform Brotherhood. You'll see a little invite there. You can come actually check it out before you commit. You can just hang out and see what is going on. There were people recommending that I also listen to another song by the same artist of Pancake Robot called Raining Tacos. That yeah. one also exceptional. All those songs, Banana Phone, Raining Tacos, Pancake Robot, in some ways, the beauty of them is their simplicity, that they're just clean and fun. And that's because God has made music to yeah. be fun. Yeah. And so even those things, Pancake Robot is a worship song at its very base, <laughs> because one, it's talking about robots, which are cool. Two, it's talking about pancakes, which are delicious. And three, the music is just super fun and catchy. And any kind of noise organized by design to be to your ear and your move is worship. So we find in this something that glorifies our creator because he's created all those things. Um, so I'm with you. I, I think that's great that any any getting children in front of like books and music is always in my mind a really good thing. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Jesse? What are you affirming this week? I'm calling like an audible in my own mind, which I realize I should have even said because it would have come out cooler if I said, oh, this is my planned affirmation, but it wasn't. But you have spurred me on in a different direction. And that is, I'm also going to affirm my wife for something that's almost serendipitously, or might we say by predestination, the same thing. So 
not more than a couple hours after we put down the mics here, my wife has organized a large group picnic for all of the neighbors that live in our block. So we live in a set of five connected townhomes here. And she's planned this. There's a canopy out back. We're going to be grilling. They're all bringing food. And we have in our just our short span here of where we live, two widows, one elderly gentleman, the our, we rent all these spaces. So our landlord is coming and also his son and his wife who takes care of the place. This is all on her own volition. And it's exactly as you kind of commended your wife for. All it is, is just to get people who live together, together and to share a meal and to have a little fun and to talk and interact in a different way. And I've been just floored by this idea because it's exactly what you described. It's just something kind. It's just something good. And we do it because God says we ought to love the widows and the orphans in particular. We ought to care for them. We ought to be more connected with them. We want to get to know them better. But also just because the people in who with whom you live are the people, the same people that you rub shoulders with. And so rather than just seeing them when we go to the mailbox or when we're all trying to shovel snow and nobody's happy about that, what a better time to do it than at the end of summer to say, let's let's have a hamburger. So I, I should say, to, again, to my wife's credit, she, she actually made like these amazing invitations too. And she went to each door and she talked to everybody and, and they were so excited. And one of the, the elderly widows that lives near us, she is actually moving out. And when my wife, Jen, expressed this idea to her, she actually teared up because she said, it would be so great to be with everybody before, before I leave. She's moving a couple hours from here to be closer to her family, to consolidate some of her stuff and to live with her son, who's going to be her caretaker. And she said to her after, like, there was this moment of kind of intense emotion that nobody expected. And then she got very serious and said, will there be hot dogs? <laughs> and she was like, yeah, sure. Like, we, we planned on grilling burgers and hot dogs. And she's like, I haven't had a hot dog and a grill in years. <laughs> so when, when Jen told me this, I was like, listen, Phyllis gets all the hot dogs she wants. So um, kindness can be grilling a hot dog <laughs> yeah. for somebody who's like, I just haven't had a grilled hot dog or the opportunity to grill a hot dog in years. Yeah. So what, a, what an amazing way, like to just show the love of Christ in a hot dog, because when we're making that hot dog, it's coming with the love of Christ. Like maybe that's the Trojan hot dog, but it doesn't matter. It's coming with the love of Christ. Yeah. I think sometimes um, Christians have this weird tendency to view some acts, certain acts of kindness as like spiritual enough. Like when we feed that's- the, when we, when we bring food to the homeless shelter or like right. when we go out and we bring like a peanut, right. Peanut butter jelly sandwiches to the homeless people or when we or like when we save babies at abortion mills. Right. Those are those are obviously very different kinds of things. They're on a different, a totally different register. But at their basic instinct, they're both acts of kindness that we do out of our Christian conviction, but not the gospel. Other things like throwing a picnic or planning a concert, those things sometimes we don't see as like spiritual enough. But they are all on this same spectrum of like kindnesses that we do for our neighbors. And this is what the early church was known for by those outside of the church yes, initially, sure. right? They were those weird people that would feed the that would feed the hungry and those weird people that would like go around town and pick up all the babies that had been left out to be exposed, you know. That that was what Christians were known for. And then of course they got they got this like label as like cannibals. People thought they were eating the babies, which obviously was not what was going on. Um, but they, they were known for these acts of kindness, right? When, uh, who was it? Uh, Pliny, Pliny the Elder, I think, which is also a fantastic beer. Yes, um, it is. He writes to his, his governor or whoever it was. He's like, I don't know what, I, I know that I probably should punish these people, but like, they're, they're not bad people. Like they're good citizens, right? right? They're, they won't worship the emperor, but other than that, they're not rabble rousers. They're not causing problems. What should we do? And the emperor basically says, like, as long as they're not causing problems, or it wasn't the emperor, like, as long as they're not causing problems, leave them alone. Like, let them do their thing. Do their thing. If, if someone brings them before you and accuses them of not worshiping Caesar and they won't do it, then, then now you've got a crime in front of you, you know, in their eyes. You've got a crime you've got to deal with. But don't go hunting them out. They're, right. they're good. They're, they're reasonable, good people that are good for our society. And I think this is going to be inflammatory for some people. That's not what Christians are known for in our modern society, right? We're not known for being people who don't stir up problems and who take care of people. 
we're known for people who are rabble rousers. Some of that rabble needs to be roused. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, I'm not opposed to I'm not opposed to causing a ruckus when it's necessary. But a right. lot of the ruckus that we cause is just it's just that it's just chaos and it's not necessary. And instead of being known for that, instead of being known for the the trouble that we cause for people and the problems that we cause for people, what we should be known for is first and foremost, the gospel that we're people who know and love and proclaim Jesus Christ, which is going to cause its own ruckus. Um, and then secondarily, as people who are good citizens, who take care of the poor, who take care of each other, who are not mean spirited, who are not busybodies, who are not sticking right. their nose where it doesn't belong. Um, I think that if we as a Christian community as a whole just focused on that, just did what we were supposed to do. Right. I'm going to channel like Conrad here, like love God, love others. That's it. Like that's that's all there is to it. And it. It's obviously much easier to say that than it is to execute on it. But sure. I think that 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 really is something we could we could probably maybe we should do like a series on this at some point of like what's what's the Christian's commitment in the world apart from like our theological and doctrinal commitments and the commitment to preach the gospel. What is our actual obligation? I think you, people would find it to be a lot more uh, earthy than you yes. might think if if you uh, didn't think deeply about it. Yeah, like gospel living is a lot more like parsley than it is about like hot spicy pepper, mm -hmm. like cayenne. And I think we want to go with the the hot, strong flavor, and yet it's so much more earth. To use your example, like earthy, we should talk about that sometime because also we're in a fine tradition of especially like the first evangelical reformers were really concerned with that exact thing that it looks a lot more like you know just boring, honestly, than it does like some kind of grand expression often. And really, that is what we ought to be known by. And those things often do result in conversations, of course, that, that can be parlayed into like the traditional gospel presentation. Yeah. And I think that's fine. And if they never do, it doesn't matter because we're being obedient and they're obedient to love others, to serve them, to put ourselves beneath them, to submit or yield or to find a way to bring people together. Yeah. That also is good in its own right. So, but again, for me, where, where I've come to on this is the way I'm, I feel totally satisfied in these things is because the intent really matters. And yeah. we know that our intent is different. And so by virtue of that fact, there is a sweetness to this that even if nobody else sees it, it is there. It is right. the foundational layer. It is yeah. the first principle. So like, yeah, maybe the hot dogs and the hamburgers will taste the same. Maybe the music will sound exactly the same, but it's all imbued with a different kind of love because that was from which it emanated yeah. and that matters. Yeah. And so I think even just in the spiritual realm, in the spiritual world, because it comes with that as its starting point, all those things do matter even when we fail to perceive them. God is always working. God is always doing his thing. And so it stands to reason then that in these normative ways, God is also always working. So yeah. I'm with you. We should talk about that more at some point. We That's should. a great, great idea. We just had like a podcast meeting <laughs> while we were recording a podcast true. and talking about nations. What, let's get negative. What are you denying against? So most of the country in the United States over the past week has been experiencing a pretty substantial heat wave, right? And uh, this has led me to do a little bit of research, primarily in the form of listening to a, a shortwave episode on this. Uh, about the heat index. And oh. I'm just denying the heat index. And here's why. Okay. Uh, the heat index, uh, so basically the human body has one real cooling mechanism and it's sweat, right? So you produce sweat, the sweat evaporates off your skin and that that cools your body temperature. It doesn't You don't just feel cooler, it actually cools your body temperature. And the reason they say that humidity is the killer is because after a certain point in the humidity, the sweat can no longer evaporate into the air because the air is right. saturated. And so your body no longer has a mechanism to cool itself. And that's where the heat actually becomes really dangerous. You can have a lot of heat. And like, it's funny, they say like, well, it's a dry heat, but like, it's dry true. Heat. If it actually is a dry heat, you can, your body can tolerate and regulate a lot more heat. If it's a dry heat where your, your body can properly evaporate off the sweat. So the heat index was originally created to help to communicate to people where that breaking point is, right? So we think of it as like, this is what the what it actually feels like. And, and that's true to a sense, but what it is, is it's like, this is what the temperature is, given the fact that your body's not able to evaporate the water off. Right. And here's the problem. I don't want to get into all the like climate change hubaloo, right? I think our climate is different now than it was before. 
we don't I don't know that we necessarily know exactly why that is. And I don't want to get into the controversy, but it, it on average of this year, it was significantly hotter than it was in previous years. The problem is that when they created the heat index, they didn't really think if I'm understanding this right, they didn't really think that our climate would ever get to temperatures regularly like we saw over the last week. So right. they did all the calculations at kind of this low level, this lower temperatures. And then they sort of like extrapolated and filled out what it might be like for these upper temperatures. And it was kind of like, it doesn't really matter if these calculations are super accurate because it's never going to get that hot. Well, it got that hot. And so they went back and looked. And actually, when the heat index is 120 degrees, they fixed the calculations. When the previous calculations say that the heat index was 120 degrees, it actually is something more like 140 degrees. So right. I'm denying the heat index because it was just plain wrong uh, in a lot of ways. But also, I think, you know, I think sometimes because we we see that like feels like we think, well, it just feels that way. So the phrasing is actually like it, it's intended to communicate something. But I think what it does is it communicates the opposite. It actually makes us feel like it's not significant because it only feels like it's that hot. It's not really that hot. It only feels like it's that hot. And the actual reality of what they're trying to do is to get you to reverse that. It is, it's this hot and that's, that's hot. But the problem is that it really feels like it's this hot. We exactly reverse that, I think, in most cases. So I don't, this isn't like a PSA, like you're smart people. Like don't, don't go out when it's too hot. Drink, <laughs> drink your water. Like I don't need to tell you how to keep yourself safe probably in the heat. I just thought right. this was really interesting. And it's kind of the one of those things where I'm like, I don't really want to hear people talk about the settled science anymore because there is no settled science. Like that's that's actually like the definition of science is that it's never really settled. So or it's part of the definition of science is that everything is constantly open to and being revised. This is a good example of that, but it also demonstrates the concept of why settled science isn't so good. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm just going to come along with you on this now because I'm I'm with you. I recognize that from having looked at it before. Because, of course, if you're outside, you, you look at the heat index, if you're doing any activity, it can be helpful. And so I remember learning a little while ago that one, it's anchored, it has a base number, a base root, essentially, so that can provide those calculations. And that was relevant to a particular time at which it was created. But you're exactly right. I think people interpret it as, oh, so like it'll just be warm, it'll feel warmer than it actually is. Right. But it's actually trying to warn you for danger. Right. That the fact that it's saying it feels this hot is because your body is not able to function properly given the context of the environment in which you are finding yourself. So it's kind of like a watch out uh, because it's trying to give you, so like you should behave differently as if it were that temperature. And because of that, then you should change, you know, how often you drink or what your exposure is, all, all that stuff. But yeah. generally I would just deny humidity. I mean, there is, Oh yeah. you're right. I, I don't know how many people in the world live in humidity or have experienced like we're talking like epic humidity, like anything above like 80, 90% is like a whole nother experience. It's like moving through tepid pea soup yeah. and it's like being locked in a Ziploc bag of your own sweat. Yeah. So it's super just uncomfortable and it can be very dangerous. So especially living where I live in the summer months, we slow down on the runs. We try to take it a little bit easier because it'll sap the strength from you. It, humidity is, is literally a killer. So that's nothing to mess with. So yeah, definitely make sure you're getting hydrated out there. You're being careful and try to understand what the heat index is actually telling you. Yeah. The other thing about the heat index that I forgot, which is probably the worst part of the heat index, is the heat index is telling you what the temperature feels like in the shade. Yes, that's true. Which no, is is ridiculous because that's not the most dangerous place to be. Uh, the the sun is often it's it's obviously far hotter and feels far right. hotter in the sun than it does in the shade. So, uh, yeah, that's that. And one thing you can do to test that if you want, like just j it just so happens that I have, like maybe many people like one of these like remote thermometer things where there's like a base in your house and you have a little sensor outside. I can't find a good place to put the sensor. So where it's sitting right now, it gets partial sun, like probably most people do. Yeah. And I will say when it gets the sun, so yesterday when it got the sun, it went from, you know, like the ambient temperature was like something like 92 when it got the sun it was like 70% humidity. So, I mean, that's fairly high. I mean, it's like being in an oven that you're making like a souffle where you have like a pan underneath of just yeah. water that's evaporating. When it went into the sun, it got up to 126. Yeah. So that's wild. Like that is what's like 
hit in your face yeah. or your body like when you're outside which is wild to think about but that is exactly a temperature so i'm with you summer or winter when the extreme temperatures come be careful watch your wife watch your kids make sure everybody's <laughs> a bunch of water yeah hashtag That's top cool. 50 healthcare podcast <laughs> hashtag top 50 we hashtag just can't combined with reformed weathercast yeah, I actually that's true. Maybe these are all the things that we love is we got some weather, we got some healthcare, some running. We got some running, we got yeah. some theology. Yeah. Just have to throw all, some atomic habits and bullet journaling into the mix. Yeah, we've got all seriously. of our information's wrapped into one. All the things. Someday that episode is coming and, yeah. and you'll know when it happens because you'll there'll be like a glory cloud will open up and <laughs> as you're listening to it. Yeah. And all these things will unite and consummate in a way that's perfectly harmonious. It's be so like the megazord of you didn't what watch that? power rangers is that one of those no ones? i saw i saw speaking again the tell was that in the telegram chat there was like a power rangers discussion or... yeah because they wanted me to make me feel old because of the power rangers first came out 30 years ago is that true wow. yeah yeah that's yeah i never never understood but never also watched so i, I don't really know anything it's like ninja stuff right kind of no <laughs> it's like ninja stuff uh, I, I mean, I guess there was a ninja series of power rangers. It's it, it's a whole thing. We don't we don't want to get into that. It's a whole thing. It would the, this would derail the episode? It, it could. It, I mean, I'm not I'm not deep in the the Power Rangers lore like I am with like Star Wars or um yeah. or uh, Marvel stuff. But there's like a whole there's a whole thing. It's a it's a whole thing. We don't want to get into it. Sometime I think, and we could do this as like a bonus episode. So at this point, this is everybody's welcome behind the curtain. We're just having a meeting now. We'll talk about John 17, <laughs> but now we're just having a podcast meeting as well. Sometime, do you think we should do like a bonus episode where we like break down a series? Like, should we break down Ahsoka at some point? Because you yeah. texted me about it. Yeah, I need to watch out? all of the all of the cartoons to understand what's going on in Ahsoka. <laughs> uh, I think I've got it mostly at this point. But uh, yeah, I mean, way back in the day when the Sorp I guess SORP 1.0, the first the first Society of Reform podcast run, uh, we had a show called the Nerd Gospel Podcast that basically just did theological breakdowns of pop culture fandoms. So we could we could do some shows like that. We could do some some yeah. that'd be a fun that'd be a fun beach series or something to just yeah. watch an episode and then talk through it after we're done. Yeah, exactly. All right. So lots of things, everybody, as listeners, brothers and sisters, you can <laughs> look forward to at some point. Those things will happen. But what we're going to talk about now is finally John 17. And I thought, Tony, let's do this. Are we if not going to do your denial or do you not have one? I'm just coming along with you okay. on that denial. Like okay. the heat index, humidity, all that stuff. It's I appreciate you making sure that I got it. In. I know that it's, one time I blasted right through it. So it's probably not <laughs> just that one time. I think I've probably I, done it more than once. I get I get yeah. lost in the mix. It's, it's all right. I appreciate you bringing that up. Uh, do you have... John 17 in front of you as well before like just in my handy dandy spot. logos right. bible software so so do i all right here we go let's do it together so here's what i thought how about so that we get this out again this sounds like we're doing a podcast meeting while we're actually recording an episode how about i do verses 1 through 12 and you take us all the way to the end is that cool yep that way it gets a little bit of variety and i think of course it's appropriate we're going to talk about this prayer it's our lord's words it's him in the garden it's him praying it seems like, of course, this is where we ought to start. And we ought to let the scripture have its full weight in our ears before we even start to talk about our observations of it. So this is John 17, beginning in verse 1. Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all to whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory with which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me, I have given to them. And they received them and truly understood that I came forth from you. And they believed that you sent me. I ask on their behalf. I do not ask on behalf of the world, 
but of those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me, and I guided them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition so that the scripture would be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I consecrate myself, that they may also be sanctified in the truth. I do not ask for these only, but for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I have made them made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known, and the love that and that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Man, how good is our God, right? I mean, just hearing this in your voice, hearing it out loud, the weight of this prayer falls on me, and I'm just overcome with how good our God is. That here is Jesus praying for us, Jesus suffering for us. And by the way, just before we even speak about this, what an example of how I would say strong prayer is filled, is rich with theology. Yeah. It's rich with expression of what God does. It's rich with expression of who God is and how he has saved us. But more than anything else, and we could probably just end it with this reading right now. I'm just overwhelmed by how good our God is. There is no one like our God. And for me, I see this principally manifest in this prayer in the garden. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm going to have to try really hard not to launch this into a Trinity episode. Um, th that's a, a whole different <laughs> way to look at this passage is just to analyze the different Trinitarian thoughts yes. and, and language and Christological stuff. One thing that I, I think we want to be careful of as we sort of like bounce this up against the Lord's prayers, it's we're not just trying to, you know, do you remember those like um, – word games you would play where like you'd have one thing on one, like you'd have a row of things on the left and a row of things on the right. You yes. have to like draw lines to match up the things. We're not just trying to do that with the Lord's prayer, right? We, mm -hmm. I mean, we could, there's, there's certainly are elements within this prayer that you can draw straight lines to, but what we're really trying to get after with these, this sort of assessing these prayers or analyzing these prayers is to really get at what the theological underpinnings of these prayers are. And how does that attach to what we learned in our study of the Lord's prayer? So for me, this, this first section of the prayer is all about grounding the prayer in who God is. And what's right on. Per, what's particularly unique about this, and, and you can't talk about this section of Scripture without getting into some Trinitarian discussion. It just wouldn't be faithful to the Scripture. We see that in that not only is Christ grounding this prayer in the divinity of the one he's praying to, being the Father, but he's grounding this prayer in his own divinity. Yes. So I think sometimes we we think about prayer, and we've talked about this in various ways. That you know, like prayer, proper Christian prayer, generally speaking, is to the Father in the name of the Son and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Right. right it's on. the mediation of the Son that allows us to come to the Father, and it's the the presence and indwelling of the Spirit that gives us the ability to come to the Father. Right. The the sort of like natural ability. But that doesn't mean that because our prayers are directed to the father as a person that somehow we are not also praying to the other persons 
or right. if we direct our prayers to the Son, which is appropriate, or to the Spirit, which is appropriate, that somehow we're excluding the Father from our prayers. And this prayer proves that, right? Because Jesus is not just, he's directing his prayers to the Father, but his prayers are grounded in both his divinity and the Father's divinity. So prayer shouldn't exclude any one person of the Trinity, certainly not certainly not implicitly, but it doesn't need to exclude any one person of the Trinity explicitly. The Father sort of stands in as the, the figurehead of the Godhead, the figurehead of the Trinity. We talked about that when we, we talked about our Father, right? The, the Father, not only is God, God as all three persons as God, are fatherly in their disposition towards people, but our prayers are directed to the Father himself as right. sort of the representative of the Trinity. And I think that that that's important for us to see here is that we, when we pray, we should be orienting ourselves towards the entire Godhead, which is a weird way to talk about it, but towards the entire Godhead. But we still have to direct our prayers generally to a person. We're not praying to the divine nature. We're not praying to the Trinity qua Trinity. We're praying to Sometimes we may be thinking of it as praying to all three of the persons of the Trinity, but you don't dialogue or commune. John Owen's work on this, um, you know, communion with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, communion with God. It's so instructive. We don't commune with the divine nature, right? That's actually more like a, a Roman Catholic error, where what salvation is, is participation in the divine nature. Now, there's a truth to that. There's an element to that that we we can grapple with on a different episode, but we don't commune and have fellowship with the divine nature qua divine nature or according to divine nature. We have truth fellowship with the Father, the Son, and the Spirit personally. We have personal fellowship. And this prayer is like the perfect model of that. This is the, the Son coming, the, this is one person of the Trinity coming to another person of the Trinity to have this prayer dialogue. Um, again, we're not going to get into all the Christology of this, but there, there are two distinct persons who are communing and communicating with each other in this prayer. And that's really key for us to remember here. It seems like you're just trying to bait me into like Ahsoka Star Wars commentary. If I say that. <laughs> because it's to, the, to your point, we're not just praying to the force. Right. So there are persons here. And the context, of course, of this priestly prayer of Jesus, and we, we say that because there's, there's a representativeness of this, of course, but it is a fitting conclusion to all of like the upper room discourse that happens yeah. in the previous chapters. So, which is why in that first verse, though, of course we, you know, modern man has mainly built these verses in to be arbitrary, at least to provide distinction and referencing these things, Jesus spoke. And then of course he lifts up his eyes to heaven and he prays these things. So I think one of, I'm totally with you because one, I think the shocking or maybe strange to the ear things about this prayer initially is that, what initially dominates this prayer, like verses one through five, is it is a prayer of Jesus for himself. Right. And that prayer for himself to the Father is centered around glory, which is the hallowed be your name. So that glory just appears like I think right. like I'm just looking at it right now, like five times in those verses. And I think initially it seems unfitting for Jesus to pray that he might receive glory for himself. But when we look more closely at that, to your point about the Trinitarian themes here that are present throughout, we find that there are several observations concerning this request for glory, which put that in a different light. And it's first that Jesus requested that he be glorified in order to bring further glory to the Father. So this position petition was not to receive glory independently but to be glorified to the praise of the Father. And then he also requested that glory would be rightfully restored to him because he belongs to the Father. Right. So your point, I think, is well taken, that this glory that Jesus receives is wrapped up in his Trinitarian identity and his proper understanding of who he is. So he's functioning in, in full mind, in sound discourse, and he's praying properly. And then Christ's glory, this the third part of that glory, is the great glory that he's about to say is going to be won on the price of the cross. Yeah. So in addition to the restoration of the glory, which our Lord possessed prior to his incarnation, there's this additional glory, which was earned by his earthly life. That's like the active obedience of Christ. And then the passive obedience of Christ in his death, that he would be glorified with the Father by his earthly life and obedience and submission. So here I find this, hallowed be your name. Jesus is actually saying, hallowed be my name in addition to the Father's name for the glory of the Father. It's remarkable. Yeah. Yeah, there's, I mean, this is, I think I just had an idea for a book. Uh, you could you could probably take this prayer and 
pull every major doctrine of systematic theology oh, out of sure. this prayer, right? For sure. Just, just to the one that just came to mind that made me think this should be a book is not only is Christ petitioning the Father to um, restore is not quite the right word, but I'm not coming up with any of this to restore the glory he had before the world. So we have to be careful uh, how we phrase this, but Christ's divine glory is obscured in that he is not displaying it. it, it we're not exactly. saying that it's hidden in an absolute sense. I just want to head that off. So he's he's petitioning the Father basically to restore him to that manifestation of his glory, to, to restore right. that manifestation so it's no longer obscured, it's no longer hidden from view. Then he's petitioning the Father to glorify him, as you said, with the glory that he's going to obtain, the glory he will merit on the cross. And then he petitions the Father to glorify his people with yes. that same glory. So, yeah, so it's it's the imputation of his act of obedience to his people, which now constitutes the church, right? We, right there, we have the Trinity, we have Christology, we have the atonement, we have ecclesiology. I mean, you could go through every major head of doctrine and pull it out of this prayer. And I think this underscores what you originally said here, is that good, crisp, theological prayer should be the norm in the church. It should be the default in the church. I think sometimes, and, and and this can go too far, right? You you can certainly pray in a way that just confuses people who are not theologically astute, and you don't want to do that. But I've told this story before, and it's not anyone that currently attends my church. It, it's not anyone that that I would run into or would, would run into this. Um, I remember one time I, I was praying in front of the church, um, and I basically prayed through the Nicene Creed, not not like verbatim, but I prayed through the major major points of the Nicene Creed was my the structure of my prayer, and he he came up to me after the service and was like, "That was such great theology. Where did you get that from?" <laughs> and and it was like we we can certainly pray in a way that can be off putting or confusing to people who don't have some of these theological categories, but we can also pray in ways that are theologically rich, right. and and. This this is a series on private prayer, so so this is a little bit of an excursus. But those who are praying publicly in the church should take time, not only immediately before the prayer, but if you know you're going to be praying publicly, to think through prayer sure. as a teaching opportunity, yes. public prayer as a teaching opportunity. Yes. Because when you speak publicly before the church, you're you're teaching in one format or another. So we have to, and this is why why going to the scriptural prayers and understanding them is so vital, not just for our own public prayers, but for our private prayers too, is that it gives us this scaffolding and this understanding. And so one thing that also struck me in this passage, in this um, prayer, is, you know, one can come away from the disciples' prayer, the model prayer, whatever we want to call it, and sort of think that, feel like it's this sort of like prescribed prayer that's actually a little alien to Christ's prayer life. Um, I've actually felt that before. When you read it, you're kind of like, yeah, but this seems so formal and it just seems so like, I don't know, formulaic. If you go through this prayer, this this follows all of the points of the Lord's Prayer. And so right when we look at Christ's prayer life and it, it extends to other, other prayers in the Bible, that's why we're doing this. This is the format and the default of prayer. Like it shouldn't be lost on people. That Christ prays, he says in verse 15, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. You're going to see the exact same footnote in this passage that you do in the in the Lord's Prayer in, in Matthew 6. That that could be the evil one or it could be evil abstractly or e evil, you know, broadly speaking. You see the same footnote. Christ is praying not only in a pattern that's consistent with what he taught his disciples, but in some ways right. he's praying the very words and the very sentences and structures that he commanded his disciples to pray when he when they asked him to teach him. So I just think this is a really helpful, instructive exercise to, to go through these. And it would be good. It, it would be a good exercise, I think, for most of us to write the petitions of the Lord's Prayer on one side and then write down write down verse by verse another scriptural prayer and do that exercise where you draw lines across and you match them up. Or maybe you highlight petition one is is orange, petition two is red, and then you go through and you highlight the same things on the other side. Because I think 
more often than not, when you look at these scriptural prayers, you're going to see most, if not all of the petitions embedded, especially in these longer prayers, they all are hitting the same notes. They're all hitting the same cadence. And that should be instructive for us that we ought to also hit those same notes and that same cadence as we're praying, whether it's public or private. Right. But yeah, and by the way, it, we didn't say this at the top, but I think it's worth noting because sometimes it just goes unnoticed. We take for granted the fact that this is recorded. So right. what this means is that, you know, John at least heard this prayer. He heard Jesus speaking it out loud, which is a great kindness because it is a private prayer, but Jesus is making this petition audibly and it's the way that it's recorded for posterity. That So just as a side, I find that to be an amazing thing that God would do that for us because there is so much in this, in this pivotal moment in Christ's life where he's under pressure that we can't even begin to imagine, where he is coming before God in honesty and transparency and complete candidness, and he is suffering. Even there, he is suffering in a different way. It's not suffering of the cross. It's not suffering in a weird, like, Mormon way. It's God speaking to Jesus, speaking to God, the Father, in a way that is, like, intensely intimate. Yeah. I mean, this is like, most of us would not like our prayer lives probably recorded in this way. And we have it for us to dissect and to understand and to repeat and to study. And I'm totally with you. There, All of this is, is couched in theology. And we might ask, in addition to like, well, how do we even have this prayer? Well, because it was spoken out loud and because John heard it and recorded it by God's grace. It was empowered by the Holy Spirit. We might also ask, why does Jesus pray this way? Like, how does he know to pray this way? And part of that, at least, is that we understand from the scriptures that he learned obedience to the study of the scriptures. Yeah. So that how he's praying this way. So in other words, like everything you said is right on. And I fear that sometimes people feel like, well, I need to manufacture then a prayer in this way. And the whole point is that you get to a place where you're not manufacturing a prayer. It's like you're so marinated in the truth of God, in the theology of the scriptures, that this is in fact the way that you pray. And it becomes natural and normative because the Holy Spirit is working in us to work out our salvation. And so in that working out of salvation, part of that is the way in which we pray we should pray differently as we move through our lives, as we continue to study the scriptures, as we meditate on it, as we come before the Lord. So I'm with you. It's interesting that Jesus prays for all of those who are given to his care and the keeping for which Jesus prayed involved this eternal security of his followers. And to me, that's of great comfort because our Lord has already spoken to his disciples concerning the frailty of their faith under fire. Like you can go to John 13, John 16, like, Christ is very clear about this. And oftentimes, you know, he says it very bluntly. So when he sa- speaks to Peter and he's like, listen, Peter, here's the deal. Basically, Satan wanted to get after you, he wanted to sift you like wheat, but I prayed for you. And some of that's embedded in this prayer. Praise God that our future does not rest upon the strength of our faith, but in the object. Yeah. And keeping is God's work. It's not ours. It's ours to abide and his to keep. When we pray like this, we're reminded of that fact. When we see Jesus pray in this way, he's, and here's the thing, God loves his son. He wants to give everything that his son, to his son, that his son asks for. And because Jesus is asking for it in the name of the father, in complete cooperation with the father's will, then we know that this prayer is going to be answered entirely. And so that's why we should have confidence that when the Reformed tradition speaks about like a surety of faith that God doesn't deliver up the baby to be left on the doorstep, that it happens here in John 17 from the lips of Jesus. And because of that, we have complete confidence. So like, again, uh, this is like what we're at the 47 minute mark. It's, this is going to be an impossible task to fit all this in, but I, I don't even know where we go from here, except that like, I'm floored by this idea that, like you said, we find all of theology richly embodied and expressed and I would say manifest as well. Yeah. And then beyond that, it's never separated from practicality. So the fact that we're understanding that surety belongs to Christ, that Jesus through the Father saves them whose he has elected is also of like the most immense practical significance. So that like on Tuesday morning, when you feel beat down, when you feel that the, the enemy is after you, is on top of you, that somehow there could be some way that you could in some possible realm lose your salvation, it's not possible because those whom God has called onto himself, those whom he has saved, he has secured. And we find Jesus echoing that he's asking for in the father wants to give his son whom he desperately loves all that he asks for. And he's asking that we might be kept. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, maybe, maybe this will be where we can put a pin in it for this week. 
we sometimes we we've made the point um both explicitly and then just by way of reference that the lord's prayer what's called what's most commonly called the lord's prayer in matthew 6 is perhaps better understood as the model prayer or the disciples prayer and that's a, I think that's a point that's well taken and something that we need to think through is that this is the prayer that the Lord has given to us. It's our right. prayer. Yes. But at the same time, I don't remember where I read this. I think it was in a volume of Christology um, essays uh, by Fred Sanders and Oliver Crisp, I think. Um, at the same time, that's also the Lord's prayer. Like we, when we think about what, what Christ prays on behalf of his people in his ongoing intercession. We don't have recorded what those words are, but it's not, it's not unreasonable since Christ commanded us to pray this way, to think he's coming before the father and he's praying this prayer right. before, before his father. He's going before the father and saying, our father, he's speaking on our behalf in the presence of yes. the father, our father who art in heaven, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come on earth as it is here in heaven. Right, give my people their daily bread, and you know all, all of this. It is our prayer, but the only reason it has any efficacy when we pray it is because the Lord is also praying it on our behalf on an ongoing basis in heaven, and that's yes. in a certain sense every prayer of Christ is the high priestly prayer of Christ, right? Not just this passage. This passage is like marked off as the high priestly prayer. I'm not exactly sure who started calling it that or when they started calling it that. But when Christ prays for Lazarus to be raised, right? Father, I know you always hear me, but I said yes. this for the benefit of the people around me. Right? Th this is this is this is Christ praying on our behalf in our stead. He's always praying the high priestly prayer. He's always praying as the second Adam who stands in our place and accomplishes our task and then merits that reward to us. Right? The glory with which he is glorified because of the cross, because of his obedience, he then transmits and imputes to his people in a priestly fashion because he is interceding. He is standing in the gap for us. That is what we need to come away from the prayers of Christ. There's any number of prayers in, in the Bible that we have from Christ that we could have looked at, but all of them are intercessory in the truest sense of the word right? It's not intercessory. We think of intercessory prayer as like, we're just praying for someone else. Like we're right. interceding on someone else's behalf. That's true, but we're not, we're not really interceding in the same sense. We're not standing. I, I mean, I remember when I was in Pentecostal circles and charismatic circles, we would commonly talk about like praying, like standing in the gap for somebody. So right. you stand in the gap for somebody. And the right. idea was almost like we were a little Christ. We were, we were, we were taking their place. We were letting Satan attack us instead of attacking that person. That was a lot of times what was there. That is just that is just garbage theology, and it just robs Christ of His glory, right? Christ is inter is is interceding for us, truly interceding for us. That's what these prayers represent. And so I want us to, as we we step away from this, we may or may not come back to John seventeen next week. We probably will come back to it, but who knows? We don't know. <laughs> we we spent all of this episode planning for other episodes. Um, but what I want us to walk away from is that that in mind, that not only is Christ interceding for us, but he's given us a model of how to pray after him, how to follow after him in prayer by showing us, by teaching us, by demonstrating it in the scriptures, by making sure by his spirit that these words were, were heard by John and recalled accurately by John and translated into Greek by John properly because Christ probably was not praying in Greek, right? So right. all of these things are... are um, are um, superintended by the Spirit for our benefit, right? For our benefit, for the benefit of his people, because this right is scripture that is useful. So I, I don't know that we can keep going without keep keeping going. So I think we should probably wrap it up for this week. Um, we do have a Telegram chat. We mentioned it earlier. You can go to t.me slash Reform Brotherhood. Uh, you can just go there and check it out. You don't have to join, uh, but we do hope you will. Um, you also have a Patreon uh, the the what is it that uh, Scott Clark says the coin in the car or the bandwidth is isn't free but it isn't cheap or how, whatever I don't know I messed that up pretty bad but um, we do have some costs associated with the podcast and we have a, a 
great group of people who have come beside us who are helping to offset those costs. But if you want to join that group of people and you've already fulfilled all your commitments to your local church and your own budget needs, um, please do consider us. You can go to patreon.com slash reform brotherhood. Um, we, we don't have any fancy prizes or fancy tiers that you're going to win or special access That's to us. episodes. That's not us. But uh, if you want to join in and, and help to keep the show going and to get theology out to the people who listen to it, um, you can join us there for, for any amount. And just pray for us, too. You don't need to give money to support us. But if you have a little bit extra, sure. we'll put it to good use. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there are, we said this before, and you maybe heard it on other podcasts, but it is absolutely true. The reason why it came to you totally free is because others have very graciously come forth to say, listen, I'll throw just a little bit, a dollar, two dollars, something towards it so that makes sure that everybody else can also hear it without cost. We really appreciate that. And it makes it so that we sound okay. It downloads at reasonable speed. All these things matter. Once you do this, you realize that like all these things matter. You could you could do it on the cheap, so to speak, but it would be pretty horrible. Yeah. So yeah. all of these modern creature comforts that you have where it sounds decent and you get access to it in every place that you want to have it, that comes at a cost. And so others have made it possible for you to do that. So thank you so much to everybody who gives. Thanks for everybody who's part of coming alongside and saying, let's journey together. Let's talk about these things. Let's get after prayer. Let's understand Jesus more carefully and closely. And then let's love others and love God and let that be it. Uh, yeah. All those things. I appreciate having brothers and sisters that say like, I'm also with you. I want to make that a priority and a privilege in my life. And I'm grateful for it. So some 359 odd episodes later, here we are. And here we are is because there's actually a community that's part of this. So it's not just my voice and your voices. There's lots of great voices. So if you want to hear some of those tech, check out the chat group. It's super fun. It's super interesting. You never know what's going to pop up there. Sometimes it's a deep theological conversation. Sometimes it's raining tacos. That's just how it goes. <laughs> it's true. And that, that is the beautiful life of those who worship God and love Jesus Christ. Yeah. Well, uh, this is going to sound like a threat, but it, it isn't. If you want to hear, <laughs> if you want to hear what the Reformed Brotherhood sounds like, apart from the support of of the listeners who help uh, help us to be able to afford decent microphones and computers to do editing, just go back and listen to like episode one, Ooh, and you'll understand. One. You'll understand what the value is. Uh, uh, and I also want to say thank you. Uh, this actually just happened today, but thank you to Brother Conrad who jumped in and hopped on the Patreon. Uh, bandwagon yes. there. Yeah. Uh, we appreciate the support. We appreciate everything that people do to to not only support us financially, but the the spiritual and just the friendship that people give us in, in the ways that they interact with us. Um, pe- somebody reached out to Jesse and offered to tune his piano. Uh, Jesse Jesse has yeah. a, 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 I think has an electronic piano, doesn't need tuning, but it was a very gracious offer. Um, so anyway, uh, I feel like this is the most appropriate time to say it after that conversation. But Jesse, honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Come and get a brotherhood. The pancake robot is coming to town. He's mixing up the bad.